Just wanted to begin this Good Friday service uh, by letting you know at the end of this video, uh, there is an announcement for you. Um, that's for anybody who would like an update on what's going on at the church. Um, that is at the end of the video. Um, but for now, uh, we're gathered in worship, and this is Good Friday. And so now Christ himself bore out our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we who glory in this death for our salvation may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our reading this evening is, is from John 19. It is verses 19 through 30 and verses 38 through 42. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him and two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers who had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top, so that they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what Scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots." And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Richard Niebuhr spoke these words during a time when the church was softening the image of the dying Jesus. It was a time when people believed that if we just thought hard enough about the problems in the world, we could fix them. The notion was that people had become so smart, so technologically advanced, 
that people believed we were living into a new age of peace. This peace was founded on the idea that we were conquering the world's issues of war, of poverty, of injustice, because we were coming up with all this great technology and had all these great ideas. The first half of the 1900s was defined by this way of thinking in the church. That if we just tried hard enough, then people would quit being evil to one another and we can fix the world. Richard Niebuhr was a prominent theologian at the time, and in 1938, he said those famous words, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. And for those of you who know your world history fairly well, and know your dates fairly well, this statement could not have been spoken at a more prophetic time. Right when the church believed that it was just one good idea away from fixing all the problems in the world, World War II happened. The world watched as millions upon millions of human lives were lost all over the world. The world learned of millions upon millions of Jewish people who were murdered because of their Jewish ethnicity. People believed that the answer to the world's problems were going to be solved because we could think our way out of sin. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. What Niebuhr is saying is that there is only one way out of sin. And that one way out is through the cross. It doesn't take living very long to realize that the problems in this world have not gone away. The virus that has interrupted, disrupted, and harmed our lives and the lives of so many people across the world bears witness to this truth. And what we must realize on this Good Friday is that sin and death are still a reality in our lives and in our world. We will proclaim a risen Christ that conquers death, that offers the forgiveness of sins, that frees us to a new way of living in the world that more resembles God's original intent for creation. But the truth of Good Friday is that while those things are true, we still live with the consequences of sin in the present. We still live in a world that is not yet what God is restoring it to be. Before this virus even happened, let's not forget that the world wasn't without problems. People have been suffering under the weight of injustice long before this virus happened. The important thing that we claim on Good Friday is that the cross of Christ demonstrates, illuminates, and validates a God that would go so far to save God's own creation by giving of his only son. You see, Christ's death was one of humiliation. The cross was a specific form of punishment in Jesus' time that was used to strip someone of their humanity and remind all who see those on the cross that this is your fate if you stand in the way of empire. The cross is lifted up high so that all can see what happens when you stand in opposition to the injustices of the Roman Empire. Like we said on Sunday, powerful people do not like being told that God will not stand for their oppression of the poor and the most vulnerable among us. Even more, the cross represents the truth that Jesus endured the humiliation, the dehumanization, the treatment of being whipped and put on a cross. He was mocked by God's own creation. And you see, the, the grip that sin has on our world is not defeated by a good idea. The depravity that is caused by sin and the brokenness that results from sin, the loss of human life, the loss of relationship, 
The loss of connection because of sin cannot be fixed by us trying harder. Jesus died on a cross because that is the only way out of the grip that sin has on humanity. Jesus' death reaches down to the absolute bottom of the human experience so that Jesus can overturn the powers of sin and death. We serve a God that would go to the bottom so that all who live on the bottom of society, the bottom of our world, can be lifted up on high, and redeemed. The cross reminds us of Jesus' love for us. It was all of creation that Jesus carried with him when he nailed, and when he was nailed to the cross. It was the suffering of people who had not even been born yet, people like you and me, that Jesus willingly allowed his own creation to nail him to the cross. It is likewise important to understand that the cross is not weakness. In fact, the notion of the cross points to the radical truth that power is made perfect in weakness. In the world, there are countless people who have made great sacrifices for the sake of others. Jesus' death gives us hope because Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Likewise, Even during this virus, there have been doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers who have died because of their unwavering love for those in whom they offered care. Those who are sick have no way of helping themselves without the aid of those who are specially trained, like nurses and doctors, and some have died providing care for others who could not care for themselves those in the military, those who are our first responders, make a similar sacrifice in that many have perished protecting and serving others. The cross is not weakness. The cross is the greatest demonstration of love in that our God would let his son die because there was no way for humanity to save itself. You see, this point of Niebuhr's quote is that we cannot overcome sin, death, and injustice on our own. Sin is too great an enemy for us to defeat without help. And the good news on a Good Friday service is that we have help. We have a God that knows what it feels like to lose a child. We have a Savior that knows what it feels like to be humiliated, abused, wrongly convicted, and murdered. We do not walk this earth without the grace of a God that knows what it means to suffer. We have hope in the truth that God hears our cries just as God heard Jesus' cries from the cross. Our help comes from the one who would go to the ends of the earth, go where none of us could have gone to bring creation back into right relationship with God. There are moments of profound pain in this lifetime. The world is not yet what God is restoring it to be. But we hope. And we hope because Easter is coming. And while there might still be a pandemic in the world on Easter, the ultimate victory is written. Suffering does not get the last word. Pain does not get the last word. We do not worship a God that died. We worship a God that died and rose again. We hold fast because that's what we are called to do. We point the world to the truth that suffering might be the story today, but it ain't the end of the story. Victory is before us. Our best days are ahead, and as followers of a crucified Savior, we hold on in the midst of this virus, Because we have seen death try to win before. And come Sunday morning, we will proclaim this truth with full authority. Because we know that death does not get the last word. Before we end, we will have what is called the reproaches, uh, which is a traditional part of a Good Friday service. 
I led you throughout the desert 40 years and led you with manna. I brought you through times of persecution and of renewal and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I accepted the cup of suffering and death for your sakes, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to lead you, but you close your hearts to guidance. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, but you gave me no food. Thirsty, but you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. Naked, but you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, but you did not visit me. Remember me, remember me, O Lord. Remember me. Amen. Hello again, just wanted to give a, a church update here at the end of this service. Uh, just wanted to let you know uh, that we have spent uh, the last, more than the last couple of weeks, uh, trying to find alternative ways to offer worship besides online. Uh, we have pursued equipment of different kinds that are needed to make that possible. All of those have not worked out. Uh, we have ventured down many paths. Um, all of that equipment is, is really hard to get at the moment. Uh, besides that, uh, this week, uh, our district superintendent, the Reverend Stephen Love, uh, made known to us that he is strongly discouraging uh, any drive-in worship services in Methodist churches in his district of Greenwood. Um, and so had we had been able to acquire the equipment, we would have had to uh, most likely cancel that either way, uh, because his instruction was, was uh, very clear that, that he is strongly discouraging that. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know that we have been looking at those things uh, very closely and pursued them very, uh, very much and spent a lot of time trying to make other ways possible. Uh, they didn't work out. Um, it's another thing that, that is really unfortunate in the midst of this. Uh, but the good news is, is that we are still able to share online uh, this would not be possible had this happened to the church 50 years ago or even 40 or 30 years ago. Um, and so we can at least be thankful for this. Um, I know it's not uh, the best and most wonderful thing we've ever gotten to do by any extent, uh, but it is something uh, that is happening. And I just wanted you to know that, 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 that that's where we are um, and that's what's happened. Um, so if you do have any questions about that, you're always welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, you're always welcome to get in touch uh, with me at any time. And so uh, that is for you. So thanks. <laughs> 